We also looked in terms of visual. This is actually one of the architecture archetypes that was not manifested in Singapore by Jeffrey Bauer, a Sri Lankan architect, who was looking at the Singapore Cloud Centre within the Botanic Garden. So actually seeing it as a drawing was actually kind of interesting. And later, Shirley will be also be talking about this building called the Jurong Town Hall. Uh, part of the map and AT tree group that was built to kind of talk about the national ideology as bred into the physical space. So this is actually looking still existing and still out there since the 80s, kind of pushing through with this idea of industry and productivity, the language of it. So without further ado, I mean like if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Then if not, I'm just gonna pass it to Shirley. All right, hello all, and uh, uh, first of all, I just want to uh, say that this is not like you know, a research paper whatsoever. It's just really whatever information I have uh, or I found uh, based on what we acquired for uh, M plus in the last uh, few months. Um, uh, and we are very thankful that it was a donation from Architects Team 3, which is the, still an existing firm today in Singapore, but completely different directors and different trajectory uh, from what it used to be. So, um, and I guess I guess the reason why we even, you know, like uh, TE invited me to, to include uh, talking about them, but also talking about, or even including the, the other booklet, the one with the Black Ops Singapore looking booklet, that's actually uh, their first wooden design competition called the Singapore Conference Hall and Trade Union uh, Congress kind of like the hall as well. So, so I guess uh, just to kind of give a little bit of an introduction about why uh, MPAS even acquired Architects Team 3, which used to be known as Malayan Architects Co-Partnership, is because it is really one of the very few, kind of like people, yeah, people have kind of dubbed them as the very early, one of the early groups of, you can say at, a point, at this point, modernist architectural practice, right? Whatever that might mean to the moment, but it was really a proponent of the modern movement within not just Singapore, but in Malaya, British Malaya, because uh, the, the firm was set up in 1961, and that was, of course, before the secession of Singapore from the Federation of Malay, of Malay, Malay yeah. And so, uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, I just wanted to kind of like, uh, am I speaking to the one? <laughs> so, so there's the reason why uh, we acquired them, because they were really pretty much the, their works becomes like almost index of the, kind of uh, the two, I guess, Malaysians and Singapore's bid for modernity, whether it's in terms of like, financial institutions, social political institutions, and you know, very much public space making um, that are of projects that are sponsored by the government. Yeah, and just uh, a little context before I bring, uh, talk a little bit more about their works is just the context of Singapore and Malaysia at this point. Okay, go on. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think, I think it's, it's important to mention, just kind of as a context, uh, politically and socially wise, what was happening at that time. So 57 obviously was, it was a very so-called the independence mood was there. This is where the British actually uh, declared that, you know, like Malaya could actually go towards or fight towards uh, their own constitution. And that was 57. So the Federation of Malaysia was, was set up in 63. And then in 65, it became, you know, Singapore seceded from the, from the Federation itself to become an independent republic. So some of the, I guess two of their projects here are pretty much at the cusp of that founding 1965. So this will bring up a very interesting point about, about what, what was the architects trying to serve, I guess, yeah. And also just in terms of like urban-wise, uh, this is a picture, a picture of the 19, around 1967 of the Singapore Central Business District. And at that point, uh, I guess the central area is uh, before this, I mean earlier before this, it will, covered a lot by central like slums and all that. So it was the beginning of almost like a, trying to make economic and productive use of this land. And Architects Team 3, if you see in this picture, sorry, here I have the pointer. Where's the red thing here? <laughs> so if you see this building over here, there's the Malaysia Singapore Airlines headquarter. Yeah, and that's that's by 83, uh, by Malaysia Architects Co Partnership. And this one over here is the Singapore Conference Hall Trade Union Congress. So at that point, this entire land, I guess you could say, the very key distinct buildings are pretty much just by them. Um, and so it just speaks of, I guess, in, in a way, when I use the word emergent here, uh, there are many things uh, of what I mean by emergent. It could be on the level of precedent setting, whether it's uh, at a point when 
when you know when urban regulations are being set up and how do the architects actually intervene and even meet that requirements or go against the requirements. I'll be talking a little bit about that and how these beliefs are express that. But the other thing about emergent uh, also has to do with what were the psyche or the kind of like ethics of what it means to design spaces for particular use or particular access, and that itself is. You know, so it, it has to do with you know what was going on in the architect's mind in terms of what is important in the planning of their space, and, and even the question of uh, what kind of uh, projection of identity or or, or through so-called modernism. Because at this point in Malaysia, uh, just a few years before this, there was this thing called the Mal Malaysianization period, and that just meant this is right after they declared that okay, you are free to, to pursue your own constitution. There was a whole idea about okay, let's use tribal tribal patterns, you know, into the building. And it was happening in the, in the, in the museum design in, in, in KL, for example. So there were these things going on. And so the question of like how does modernity or modern modernism uh, manifest itself in the design of buildings were, were, were in question. And, uh, oh, and I guess later on in all the other projects, you will see that uh, MACP, just to cut it short, Malaya Fiscal Partnership, had manifested it in a different way. What would that mean? Is it technocratic kind of like futurism or is it really tribal kind of language? So that's that's just one question to ask what emergent actually meant for architecture. Uh, so yes, that's just a little bit of the of the background and I'll go straight into the their works, which is here. So just a, as a as a background, uh, MACP being Malayan architects, uh, they're not just designing in Singapore but also already what's happening in the Greece and Milan that's in um, uh, Saramban, Saramban, uh, Malaysia. Where's the pointer? Here. Okay, <laughs> so that one here. So again, for this mosque, there was an early mosque by another bunch of architects uh, in KL. But this mosque was built at the same time, and its, it's use of this hyperbolic roof uh, is a huge statement to make when you could have used something completely tribal and Islamic in pattern. Yeah, calligraphically inspired and all that. But this is purely engineering, kind of like, uh, I mean, this is the first time of Arab even got involved. Arab is our major engineering firm. In, in the entire, I guess, in the entire world, I dare say, it was their first time building a mosque. And ATP actually invited them to, to be part of this project. And so the question of why would you invite such a very much engineering-based design for a mosque is a big statement about what they see as modernism uh, and the way it's manifested. Uh, and also, back in Nagara, uh, in Penang, this is also what they did. And you could tell, I guess some people could tell, like, the fins are some people, some people, I'm not saying all. Uh, similar to what was happening, uh, there's a civic center in Boston that people, some people have related similar design to it. But again, you can tell that their language is really beyond what was happening in Malaysia or, or, or local politics identity, but it's really kind of like uh, responding to what was going on elsewhere. And of course, even this one, even though it started, it was only built in 86, but it started as a conception in 62. So uh, Comtar, or Comtar, which is like a complex, a very, very long name. Anyway, it's a major urban regeneration project in the middle of Chinatown, Penang, uh, with, with, together with Buckman and Fuller, was also part of their project. So this is the context of all their projects that's happening outside of Singapore. And I just wanted to kind of contrast this to an example of what I meant by tribal. I'm not saying that Alfred Wong just makes these kind of buildings. I'm just saying it's an example of how that spirit of the local um, localism uh, could, be, could be expressed at that moment, at that period. And you could tell that MACP was going in different uh, and so, again, houses are very far so called from ideological, a lot of people think. But for them, for the young architects at that point, when they just came back from uh, mostly from Australia and the UK, but, oh, just as a background, uh, Malayan Architects Co Partnership and Architects Team 3, and the reason why I relate the two is because the founding or uh, the co founding architect is called Lin Chong Kiet. That's the main guy behind the two firm, the main force of design, I guess you can say. And he was uh, trained in the University of uh, West Manchester and then later on at MIT. And so that's the training that he has in his mind. So you can tell if you know like the lineage and where he's coming from. Uh, but yeah, so Lin Chong Kiet is this name here. Uh, and this is his first time before he set up um, uh, MACP together with two architects called William Lin and Shen Ru Fi. He did this house and you can tell at that point uh, it was a big deal, but that roof was a big deal. Um, and the idea of the cantilevered floor and all that. I mean, these are all very small kind of like features. Uh, doing what kind of houses you have to be. But at that point for you to actually decide on such a such a such a spatial, you know, the idea of the yeah, such a such a features are, are, are pretty much a big statement about what kind of what the kind of redefinition of what residential design was. Even if it is a small scale, it also reflects the kind of client that you were also designing it for. And mostly is the new need, you can say, doctors, lawyers and so on and so forth. 
Uh, again, it's not just in Singapore, but this is also in Pataling Jaya, South Selangor. And it happened that at that point, there was a, a new body of architect institute in Malaysia. They started a competition called the Ideal Homes, and this home actually won an award uh, for that. And so the question is, why would an architecture body set up a, a board system for homes? But it just meant to me resident, residential design was a big uh, gesture in terms of where we're going uh, you know, in terms of our, our profession and development. And this is basically a house for Micho Yao, and um, uh, is actually the, the founder of UOB Building, and, and, sorry, United Overseas Bank, not building. Yeah. So you can tell the links of how um, these are all the major ties for the you know, for this MACP in the very beginning. Uh, and then in terms of like just other things, uh, you could tell uh, in terms of the, the material that are being used, the timber kind of like um, uh, timber. But these timber is actually layered and it's actually breathable. And to some, in, in terms of the, the lobby, I, I, I can't show the detail over here, but it, it, there's just many more features to talk uh, to, to refer to in terms of their design and their use of uh, of, uh, of steel even and, and and just the kind of like open garden roof decks. Uh, these are all really kind of uh, experiments for uh, for MACP. Yeah, so I'm just going straight next to the public buildings, and uh, obviously the Singapore Conference Hall and Trade Union House was started as a. It was the very first competition. Uh, at the moment, on text it's called international competition, even though it only had 18 entries in the end. Uh, so it was the first time that it was a riba riba based kind of like standard sort of competition. Uh, and it actually was conceived in the early 60s when, okay, before when the, uh, the People's Action Party uh, was uh, was in very much alliance with the trade unions. And so at that uh, at that at that moment of election, uh, the government actually or the party actually promised that there will be a facility made just for the trade unions for their meetings. Uh, and so, but later on, for those who know Singapore's history, there were some. Um, can we comment about that? what happened to trade unions? I mean, I, I, want, I want to hear you know, mention a little bit about that. Well, of course, like, trade unions take on very, like, say, uh, leftist kind of, kind of connotations. And the last trade union uprising was actually in 1988, 1980, okay. under the auspice of the former president, and then the really prime minister of the HR. But also, like, trade unions were later in, uh, instrumentalized by the state. Um, this all to form a singular board representing individual, uh, individual, individual uh, professions. So in terms of discussions of rights or like the discussion of values were very much merged under this singular entity controlled by the government. Yeah, so I'm just saying that it's actually a bit of an irony that that's why it is an irony that this whole thing was conceived for the trade unions. And if you were to read the booklet out, out there, the statements that are being made about this building was like, you know, it's bringing Singapore towards the socialist uh, you know, direction and so on and so forth. So, so you know, but yeah, you know, architecture cannot be completely extreme. In, I mean, how much can ideology? Sorry, how much can ideology be be expressed? Uh, you know, like a uh, political in, in a kind of like extreme way in a building. You can't. I mean, in a way, it's not like art, but you can make a very direct statement, right? But what I guess what uh, MACP did for this building uh, that is direct in the statement of so-called the trade union is that there's this notion of transparency uh, of, the, of the trade union body uh, in their meetings. And not only that, the second notion is about the international. So this, this building is not meant to just house the offices for the trade union staff, but also meant to be Singapore's first international conference center. So the idea of the meeting point for multinationals and all that sort, sort of thing. And so even in the design itself, uh, people were saying that this is like completely not you know, very Singapore identity and so on. So I mean, again, what is Singapore identity? So to him, I mean, to, to again, to MACP, what was key here was the, the part about about how is can see from here. Uh, this is actually the ideal design where there's actually a reflective pool over here, but it did not, it did not fulfill itself in the end. But you could tell that the entry is meant to be very, very clear. You could tell that this whole concourse is a very open one, where it leads to the layered terraces and the stairwell that leads to the upper floors are all visible from the street. Well, of course, later on, you can in the, in the building itself. So over here you can tell that the, the model, so it's a very, even in, in a so-called structure, uh, the so-called, you know, Corbusian grid, and that's where all the services are, are basically arranged. And so, so it actually leaves all the, the open areas completely, uh, I guess in a way, unburdened, uh, just for people to access and, 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 uh, and, and travel throughout. And uh, over here is, um, and so yeah, so I think, I think there, there's much more to show. 
Well, yeah, it'll be entrance. And I just wanted to go and look at this. Uh, this is a circulation kind of path to just cite where, where the building was cited. Uh, it's also found in the souvenir brochure uh, outside. And you can tell that it is really much lined uh, along the main path of the uh, Shenton, Shenton Way. Again, at that point, uh, isn't, you can tell it doesn't exist like this anymore. Uh, the building still exists in Singapore, but you can no longer see it like that because all these are reclaimed now. But at that point, it was a big deal that it was so-called the first building by the waterfront, and it's so-called the new waterfront that is not the colonial waterfront by Singapore River, but this is the, the other waterfront. So it's meant to make a statement at that level also about, about a new kind of institution and a new kind of independence, right? And so in terms of this, uh, the importance of this as being a civic center, civic hub, uh, was how it's actually set back on the road and it's very much along the bus routes and, and so on and so forth. So, and you can enter, there are multiple entrances as well from the parking lot in the back and then from the street here. And then, uh, so yeah, so that's, that's the, the way it's, it's, it's laid out. And in terms of the facilities, uh, you can tell that this is a major, uh, major open space. <laughs> Sorry, I got blue in the whole office. <laughs> Uh, and so yeah, this is just meant to be, uh, not only that, but one big thing about the concourse is that it's actually uh, naturally ventilated. So this whole thing here, apart from all the rooms are AC, but the whole thing here is actually not AC. And that's a big deal also for an architect uh, to decide to do for such a climate. So dealing with the locals, for them is pretty much a climatic solution, but also um, uh, really just, um, I guess there's a bit of an ethics of what it meant to build for, for the local context. So yeah, and, and so the transparency of the use of glass you know, is it's more visible at night where you can really see everything. Uh, it's almost like the yeah, organs and it's all, all being visible. And that's a very clear uh, reason for that and that sort of openness and accessibility. Okay. Sorry, I'm not like... Yeah, okay. So here it is. Uh, so this is part of the concourse. Uh, so you can tell the openness and... So basically, the whole thing is open, and there is a glass that's actually layered, a uh, structure in it is layered so that the, the air can come in. Again, I don't have a sectional like detail drawing for that one, but I guess it's the whole course. And then you can tell that the entire concourse here, this is really the maze that connects all the other facilities. And more pictures there. Yeah, there are much more details I can bring up, but I think I'm really short. So the next one is the Malaysia Singapore Airlines building. Again, it's really um, another institution that is pretty much at the cusp of the transition politically between the two nations. But to me, when I, I, I again, I didn't have too much information about this building apart from one or, one or two articles. And at the moment, it's really more than just a, for for okay for Malaysia Airlines partnership for them uh, to be emergent here is really more than just a an aesthetic. It's highly technological construction wise. And for them to build this, like, it was the first so-called slip core uh, construction method where basically the, uh, the entire yeah, the lift is actually built right in the middle and, uh, and, and the entire floor are actually kind of delivered from that, uh, from that main core. It's a big deal structurally, yeah? So, so the uh, design is really about structure as well. It's not, and, 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 the, and making a precedent of that. And another key thing about this building is also the, the three-floor podium. This is actually a three floor, but at that period, by the way, um, you are at that moment the planning authority had actually said that all buildings within uh, this area could only go up to two story podium, and then you build uh, superstructure or, or floors above it. So I guess uh, uh, I mean, he actually went against that and said we're going to propose a three floor podium because it is in terms of, I mean, to them, design and planning and aesthetics is a big thing. It all, it all, it all comes together, and from then on, after this building, I think already actually allowed for a three-floor podium, uh, uh, podium design or code, I think you can say. And uh, another aspect of this um, of this MSA building, so this is just a hanger. Like, this is part of our archive uh, of what the, I guess in the, in the architect's archive, they actually kept these slides of MSA um, when, before it dissolved, yes, before it separated. And so that's what uh, MSA building was. It was really one of the only distinct buildings in that neighborhood. And over here is just uh, again it's not in the collection, but I just found an image of the roof of the rooftop garden of the of the, of the building where it, I don't know to me when I saw it, it was like my goodness, this is really an entertainment center, not all like a almost more than just an office for an airline headquarter, but it's almost for the staff, but also for visitors and the lobby there. So yeah, there's like sculpture gardens and all kinds of 
and so on and so forth. So you could tell in other buildings by MACP, they actually, or by Lin Chong Kiet, he is a very big cultural uh, patron. He always encouraged the clients to build, uh, to collect art, acquire art, and install art in their rooftop garden. It was part of his, almost his approach. Um, again, I don't have documentation, it's all to our history and, and what he said about his involvement in these projects. But well, you can tell that at that point, the emergent belief is here, is shaping the client, shaping what the so-called commercial building office building could be apart from just its functional use. Um, yeah, so this is more, and this is another image of the, of the pit water. And you can tell how near it is to the, uh, to the um, conference hall and the waterfront. Yeah. So another key building is the, is the Development Bank of Singapore building. Uh, this was, by the way, built almost at the same time as the United Overseas building and it is Singapore's first 50 story tower. Um, again, it was a again this is on the notion of like emergent as in like the very first to build so-called the big league skyscraper is also by uh, but at this point they already split they become architects team three no longer MACP so new partners apart from the Chong Kiet who is the same guy as from the, the previous practice. Um, and this is a, again at this point uh, this big plot uh, by the way the development bank of Singapore is actually the government bank uh, it, it actually is the financial arm of Economic Development Board, and this whole site is meant for them. And they could have built three different towers. They could they have fought three plots. They could have built three big towers. But uh, so in oral history and in, in writing statement, uh, AT3 actually uh, chose to actually build it in almost like a set, a set way. So only have one superstructure of a tall tower. And then the podium here is made of two kinds of podium. One is a three-story and one is a seven-story. Um, and this is the seven story, three stories on the other side. And so for them, uh, for them, it is actually more important uh, for the building to not block the view of the other uh, uh, the surrounding, the surrounding building, or the view by the surrounding building of the waterfront. And that to them is actually a very key point. And another very, very key point, because of how slender this building is, at that point, there was a huge wind tunnel effect, uh, kind of a suction effect, basically, uh, around these buildings, that are, around the surrounding buildings. So the model of this building actually had to be Okay, just to give a context of where over here is the build, the halfway is under construction of the EBS uh, building, and this is the entire podium. And this is LCK signature, by the way. This whole thing is a is a is a photo given to the new directors of AT3 by the old directors. And so yeah, this is actually not a real photo. It's obviously uh, 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 yeah, their new design being a okay, photo of their model being superimposed on the existing photo of the site. Yeah, so this is just to project what it could be, and you can tell that it's, um, yeah, they, they, they're very clear three story here, and then seven story uh, uh, podium here, and then this one structure. Yeah. Uh, I guess the techno uh, construction, structural sort of like uh, approach is it's much, very much part of the, 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 the priority that the architects place on, on design. And so it's up all the major uh, yeah, photos, of the, photos of the model in terms of the yeah, details. And this is the opening, uh, I guess you can say the topping off, and that's been talked yet over here during the. And so it is very much, again, it's a, it's a Japanese contractor, by the way. Um, and uh, and yeah, all the major, like Ministry of Finance and all that, it's all, it's all in this photo so one can identify. So it's very much a government project. And this is just a map of, uh, the, uh, of the entire yeah, longitudinal section of the building where you can tell that, uh, I mean, you can read very clearly, these are meant to be the public space. So there's another very key thing about the buildings that are by 83. Again, okay, another similar rooftop concrete sculpture garden right by the staff office or staff lounge of the podium. Okay, I guess you can almost reduce the kind of influences that he had and the idea of the role of culture within a corporate kind of culture. And that's the uh, brochure, a brochure, brochure. And this is a very key key uh, point. So this is meant to be the very first time where they actually uh, a, a commercial tower trying to create a very harmonious street that allows the public to almost go up and go up to the shops. So to them, it's almost like you know, the public space, I guess, notion, but through a very, of course, a very commercial, highly commercial usage. Uh, and so that's another another effort that or attempt that architects made in integrating the, the streets into the building. And this is just like a, a little uh, kind of like satirical uh, collage by Louis, Louis Hellman. And Louis Hellman, by the way, is a very important comic artist for like Pete Brad and all these people in the 60s. And, and Chonkin and him happened to be friends, and when this building was built, he came up with this collage to show like, gosh, this building is so futuristic, but maybe in a few years' time it might be, you know, it might be uh, an antique and it might be, you know, uh, have to be rescued for conservation or something like that. So it's just 
and I predict in the future to show how futuristic it is. And uh, yeah, so this is an example of a close up of the, of the streetscape and the arcade. And I guess, yeah, this is the last building uh, for Jurong Town Hall. Again, uh, 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 away southwest side of the island of Singapore is pretty much the beginning of the so called, you can say, factories, but it's not only factories, it's all mostly um, uh, industrial in terms of like packaging and you know, assembly lines and all that stuff. And so this, at that point, by uh, this is 1969, by 1967, there were already factories in that land, but JTC, which is the Jurong Town Corporation, the major, uh, I guess you can say, arm of the government to not just plan for facilities like these, they, they had gone beyond planning for factories. They're not going to be planning towns. So factories are not just going to be factories, but they're going to have housing, they're going to have just recreational gardens, and so on and so forth. So, so this Jurong Town Hall is pretty much the nucleus in which this entire town will be planned around. Um, and so it's not, so I guess the question of like, why do I need a civic center for this town hall, this town that is yet built? So far it has only factories, but that's the, that's the thing that it's, it's meant to aspire to, is really to build something that uh, could almost uh, stimulate the growth of the community around uh, or near the, the industrial centers. So this is a sketch from the Slovenia brochure, the building, and you can tell that it's meant to house pretty much the offices of Jurong Town Corporation, but it's also meant to be a lecture theater, a conference hall, a, uh, a, another concourse. So you can tell even in their, in their uh, planning here what would, be, what would be the main important space. Again, it's the concourse. And it's also this glass rooftop. Similar treatment as all the other buildings. And of course, uh, even the, the idea that it's actually on top of a, of a elongated hill and how it's, you know, like uh, the orientation of views and everything is really meant to almost cement this building as a, as a, as a key launch pad, I guess, for the town. So yeah, you can tell this one is the, the main concourse again. Okay, almost done. And so I guess uh, this thing about the clock tower uh, is a big one, uh, in a way. Uh, highly, it was, it was a last minute addition according to the architects. Uh, they, felt, they felt like they must have something, almost like an air, aircraft uh, informal monumentality about it, like a spaceship aircraft, and just kind of like pointing to the so-called futuristic uh, direction of the whole, the whole planning. And, and again, it's a, it's actually, uh, the clock tower is going to be viewable from three sides. Uh, again, it's just meant to be, you know, the idea of it being in the center of the entire, um, entire development. And so, yeah, this is more images of that. I shall not say more. Again, another cartoon by Louis Hellman um, about the building. Um, it's, uh, so, yeah, I just wanted to end, I guess, with this little quote uh, from the Tonkin, uh, which is, if nationalist tendencies are unchecked, uh, there is real danger in many of the developing nations that our future development would become a sidelined discussion based on the myth of cultural independence. Instead of taking root as a progressive discipline that can offer newer and better technological and aesthetic solutions. So some of the key words here, uh, as much, I mean, as a background, I guess, or in reflection to what I've shared, is that it's really more than just an identity, it's about style. Or, or the idea of developing an emerging architecture for style, but really on the level of uh, uh, style as though it belongs to a particular space because he actually, he, the key word here is the myth of cultural dependence because it's key because at that point he is almost acknowledging that influences come from everywhere else, not just from you know, where we are. Where we are. Um, and how uh, to make architecture as a progressive discipline it would be required to think about all these other aspects as well, solutions, technological and aesthetic solutions, and not just limiting it to uh, kind of like a formal expression. And so again, so as much as all these buildings have so-called you know, formally very distinct features, but they're really not the end of it. It's like shown in all the public spaces that they try to craft out, the use of materials, uh, structural technologies, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's really part of the part of his uh, his, uh, his, uh, his, uh, his firm's uh, belief in, in architecture as more than just that sort of like yeah formal expression. Thank you. So, I mean, what we have here is also a country that's going to be, but the being is also a certain important in the sense of a very formalistic sense, like the buildings, the views that they express, such as being for people trying to integrate the streetscape into the building. One would also take it into consideration for even how like say shopping malls have been built in MTRs in Hong Kong, or even the integration of like people, the flow of people circulating in the United States. Because um, I think spatial-wise, the sensation of being within the States 
is pretty much crafted by the encounter of the architects. In the 80s and the 60s, there were many considerations as to, like, as to, like, say, what, how does one encounter the shop? How does one encounter the progressive moving up? We're talking about a time where there wasn't, um, there, there were still elevators, but only for the privilege. So, like, the encounter of time and the progression within the space is pretty much slowed down in terms of temporality. So that's pretty much uh, being driven here. But what we have on the second hand is also like this idea of like public housing, even right? urban planning itself, the bigger landscape, other than individual buildings by architecture, architecture plans. Even even then, like these uh, buildings have taken into 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 account the spatial arrangement or the urban planning of the town itself. But from a bigger plan, units over here will talk about like mainly about public housing and even like the development of how it plays out to be, like what is the encounter of men within such housing needs because the needs for housing is very different from like say the needs of like um, public buildings, even though they are for the people. Back to the bottom layer. 
In the scene of a teetering island resembling an inverse excavation, housing is the one component that threats through them, threats through all the layers. Indeed, it is by now a known fact that housing is one of the main imperatives for nation building. Take a look at the last concept plan of 2011, with the bulk of the industrial sector located on the southwest of the island and the main catchment areas on the west, those are in green, central and east, over 50% of the island land mass is given over to residential purposes. Compare this to the 2001 island concept plan and we see that in terms of land area that housing occupied, there was a kind of decrease. Go back another 10 years to 1991 and we see that housing used to be differentiated between high and low rise. And the reason seemingly for the decrease is the predominance of high rise housing since then. So after 91, you see a decrease in footprint, but an increase in housing. At the same time, there was almost twice as much green areas in 91. Moving backwards, in 1980, the master plan was based on the very first concept plan that was released since independence in 1971. Housing at this time was separated into permanent, temporary, and resettlement. This entire master plan, plan was supported by a thousand sheets of town plans and where a few special areas were highlighted, including woodlands in the north, Bukit Panjang, Yochukan area, where I will zoom in later on the new, first new town built by the nationalist government, uh, Tapayo, and um, Changi Badok, and then the central downtown area. Two years before the release of the master plan, the Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew had articulated the question of survival at the 26th World Congress of the International Chamber of uh, Commerce in Orlando, in Orlando this year. And I quote, on our island of 224 square miles were two million people. We inherited what was the capital of the British Empire in Southeast Asia, but this member from the neutral language was the empire. The question was how to make a living, how to survive. This was not a theoretical problem in the economics of development. It was a matter of life and death for two million people. The realities of the world of 1965 had to be faced. The sole objective was survival. How this was to be achieved by socialism or free enterprise was a secondary matter. He answered his own question. The answer turned out to be free enterprise. Tempered with the socialist philosophy of equal opportunities for education, jobs, health, housing. What Lee was referring to was this, a young island nation state that had been planned to look somewhat like this based on a concentric configuration with a large central catchment area that was based on this 1963 green plan that was proposed by a bunch of experts that uh, visited Singapore for one month in 1963, who were called the United Nations Technical Assistance Team. And they were sent to give the fledgling nation a helping hand in its development planning. The team only had this to work with, which was the very first and last master plan prepared by the previous colonial government from the mid 1950s, and it was publicly released in 1938. But it was never enacted since the British left in a hurry. In the 1958 Marshall Plan, however, many areas have been designated as new towns. Most have blueprints that were meant to be developed, very detailed blueprints with uh, plan units of the housing. But many of these could not be realized because either of number one, the shortage of municipal funds, or two, they simply had no time to get them. Top Island was one of this, and uh, it was marked out in the master plan with only a draft plan, and no work had started then. The, this land was primarily occupied by farmers and squatters housing the lower working classes. Okay, before delving into Top Island, let us take a detour to another island that had opened not too long ago based on very similar principles as those articulated by Lee. Except that in this case, it was called, it was explicitly meant to be a land of happiness, I quote. Theme around the familiar structures of the American urban and pastoral landscape, 
but technologically engineered and highly managed. This new land which opened in Anaheim, Orange County, Los Angeles was Walt Disney's brainchild and personal utopia. Walt Disney's utopia was only partially realized in Disneyland, for he had imagined that um, Disneyland is not only to be a theme park, but to contain the principles and technologies of planning for a better future world. Immersing in utopian planning books by Ebenezer Howard's Garden City of Tomorrow that was published at the turn of the 20th century, and more recently, Victor Gruen's book, Heart of the City, Walt Disney had offered four pavilions which he tested out at the New York World's Fair in 1964 and 65. Then after that he proceeded, um, during this time he began to develop his ideas for APCOT, which stands for Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow, which was based on a concentric radii plan with the highest density in the center and surrounded by a green belt where people would get out their cars at the periphery and they'll enter and they'll circumvent and move around um, in monorails and people movers. This was tested out first in Tomorrowland and Disneyland to make sure it worked. Unfortunately, Walt Disney did not live to see the opening of this new world as he had imagined as an experimental community. He died in 66. Almost all of his ideas on community were not realized. Although the futuristic looking high rise commercial uh, center and the modern rail were retained. These found their way into the Straits Times newspapers in that same year. And if you look at the, the, that year up to 1971, judging from the number of newspaper coverage in Singapore on Disney, its successful model of enterprise led socialism must be of particular interest. That year of the announcement, the first estate in Tapai was completed and the flats opened for balloting. Sitting on the large tract of barren land that was once a swamp of farms and houses, the new town literally rose from ground zero. In fact, it was to Bularasa twice over because the sand that was leveled from the swamp and hills were used to reclaim um, no, miles down south what is now what is called the Kalam Basin, which was to be an industrial and housing estate. So Topaya, built by the Housing Development Board, HDB for short, was constructed in two phases between 1964 and 1987. It contains the majority of housing experimentation within the nation state. You will see all kinds of different tests on housing typologies of different forms and shapes that were tested out during this time. Particular were also the organization of land, the introduction of what community means, the neighborhood principle, and the building of a variety of high-rise type blocks, and the transplantation of diasporic communities through resettlement and reallocation. HDB's plan comprised a town park that um, and an industrial complex at its core. So actually that's here. In contrast to HDB's centrally uh, rationalized plan, so it radiates out, the plan left behind by the colonial government, um, the SIT, the Singapore Improvement Trust, in 1958, showed a very different envisioning of the new town. It showed a large, idyllic garden city planned, a, a garden city suburb planned around relatively narrow roads. You can hardly see the road under the trees, and it has a much less definitive center. Construction began immediately after independence, estate by estate, and the traffic ring around the center began to take shape. The first phase of Tuapaya was completed in the 1970s. By 1978, 36,000 units had been completed, housing 190,000 people. Tuapaya was one of, oops, I'm sorry. Tuapaya is here and it's one of 11 new towns that were literally built from scratch. 
At 325 hectares, it was exactly five times the size of Disneyland, but a very small fraction of Disney World, which is actually 11,000 hectares. Disney World is way larger than That same year, so it's not by coincidence and it's sufficient evidence that uh, there's a lot of learning from. That same year, Prime Minister Lee visited Disney World in Orlando for the first time, speaking at the 26th World Congress of the ICC and referring to the impending Asian economic crisis. He immediately emphasized this. It will be enterprise, he said, operating in a free market, not subsidies and protectionism which will lead the way out of this present economic trauma. This is more than an act of faith. It is a lesson of history, we hope history. Um, the history of the Great Depression followed by protectionism. There must be a saner and more rational solution to our present problems. This thing continued to be featured in local media pretty heavily. The 1982 opening of the second theme park in Florida, the Epcot Center, which emulated Walt Disney's original idea of showcasing new technology. Although itself, it was closer to a world spirit than really what Walt Disney imagined as a community of tomorrow. Um, incidentally, the third theme park opened in 89 and the fourth one in 98. And this was very interesting because it coincided with the with the uh, three international conferences for urban planning, housing, and design that was organized by the Singapore Institute of Planners, of which it was uh, headed by actually uh, the chief planner of the URA. So uh, way too many coincidences. Um, at the opening of the third convention, the Minister of National Development at the time had presented the criteria for making a study for the next Millennium. This was in the late uh, 97, around that, uh, around 97. And he listed the criteria explicitly as, I quote, a city of the next millennium, vibrant, attractive, and memorable. Contents of his speech were direct parallels with Walt Disney's original ideas for Epcot Center. In fact, the Disney Development Company had ventured into community planning and housing design themselves with the building of Celebration that was seven miles south of, Orlando, of uh, Disney World Orlando, 11 minute drive. At 2,000 hectares or 20 kilometers square, the plan was based on the idea of early 20th century American landscape of low rise houses set amidst parks and trails. The first phase from the center outwards was completed in 96 and it was attempt by the then CEO to, I quote, he said, to make history by extending Walt Disney's original vision of a community building. By the mid-1990s, the language of HDB in describing the housing communities that it built took on a very similar euphemistic tone. A Wonderful World was the main heading for its 1994-95 annual report. I'm not going to read all of it, it's very but I have to. Uh, so I read part of it. To a child in the HDB heartland, every new encounter brings with it drama and a sense of the unexpected. Reflections in the mirror, clouds and curious formations, colors and shapes that leap out, even lines and edges that curve and wave from different angles and perspectives. In this world full of sight and sound, a young mind is constantly challenged. It sees exciting vistas of myriad colors, dimensions, shapes, and sizes that intrigue with the promise of new and unexpected. A world where tall, towering buildings are homes in the sky. It is this world in the HDB heartland that you will explore in our annual report, where things are exciting and dramatic and constantly surprising. Sorry, that was, uh, I have to do it. <laughs> Utilitarian housing, HDB launched its first public housing competition in 2001, which saw over 200 international entries. The 2.5 hectare site was significant because it was the site of the first two 10 story HDB blocks that were built in Tanjong Paga. That was the very first and last constitution that was held by the 
then minister mentor Lee Kuan Yew. At 50 stories high and with two landscape sky gardens on the 25th and the 50th floor, connecting the seven tower blocks, the project was important for HDB both in its commemorative significance as well as to announce its new phase, which it stated in the competition um, publication. Is there a limit to HDB design? This brings us to the latest master plan, which uh, Singapore is currently uh, work basing itself on, which focuses on the theme of sustainable Singapore. And it returns us back to the very beginning of my talk, where private enterprises and developers such as Capital Land enter the picture. Here, not Capital Land, but a Singapore but the SG, but the Singapore Property Master Plan for 2030, prepared by an international property consultants company. Private enterprise has and is re-envisioning the nation. So I would like to conclude with our artifact that is uh, that we have put out there in, uh, on exhibit which is a fragment of what, through our research and analysis and speculation on what Topaya could have been if it was planned based on a different paradigm. Taking the archaeological approach using the firstly, um, the colonial SIT plan of 1958, and then the subsequent uh, uh, plan by HDB, which was straightened out and orientated in a rational manner according to sun directions, plan around the uh, ginormous traffic uh, pattern. This drawing is an exploration and reinvention of the figure ground mode of representation. It aims to absorb multiple plans from a variety of milestone periods in the history of the island, city, island nation, combining conflicted ideas of what is actually um, a garden city and what is garden city plan. Climatically efficient execution from an, uh, so the balancing of uh, an efficient, climatically efficient uh, rationality or on the more picturesque uh, um, planning principles by the colonial government. Using a swath of twilight that cuts through the town center, this drawing assembles and narrates architectural plans of the raised theologies the void deck, the raised um, housing blocks, alongside a variety of speculative open spaces to reveal a rich and continuous public ground plan, never before documented in the conventional urban plans of Singapore we've seen so far. To navigate uh, you through this highly complex uh, plan, a legend of the various architectural notations is provided to explain the various operations which are based on an overt anti-thesis on our part against consumer objective public open spaces. For each of these plans, we identify and draw out the key elements which drive the overall planning and produce the eventual aesthetic. The humanist elements of the aborted SIT plans are deployed to trigger more spaces for the people, such as a variety of ground surfaces, from void decks to larger overground patches and diverse pathway types and textures. More void decks are created, carving up the existing housing blocks. Grounds are reworked. It's, uh, it was hilly and swampy, now it's flat. So grounds are reworked and pushed and pulled and returned to more topographic definition with terracing and urban furniture and roofs are converted into community decks and gardens. Roads are reclaimed back for the pedestrians as they get covered, planted, overgrown, and paved. And finally, the figures of the SIT housing flats clustered around small quadrangles and play areas are recalled back as urban ruins, as follies for play and gathering places. So this is my concluding slide. This research project on planned utopias and what ifs is at once an excavation provocation and the speculation on another possible future.
and his representation was highly mediated, depending on you know what's the platform in which he was represented, and so whether it black or white or color, and every aspect of it determined. Um, I remember a conversation with an art historian who, for the longest time, thought that um, all Greek statues were white until, uh, or at least there was this discussion by the art historians that until they discover actually that it was white because over time they faded out, but actually they were highly colorful. And so that set up a whole like set of conversation about color in Greek sculpture. And so it's very similar in architecture. Um, a lot of the times we uh, understand them even in uh, the reason what got me fascinated with how Singapore represents itself is because it um, all is uh, kind of at the very high level and even uh, down vertically. Everybody understands the power of mediated uh, imagery and they have been using it very effectively at every level. Um, that's why you can look at the brochures, the stands that they produce on the post there, so in kind of uh, reiterating the Okay, we know it's a Tuesday night and yeah. it's really like 8.45, 8.50. People will be hungry. There's a bit of some drinks over there and then like maybe if you want to grab some drinks and we can have a chat or something. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.